the crown there. Call the bell. In June of 1929, this guy, Charlie Patton, a Mississippi Delta singer and guitar player, would take the long train ride 750 miles from Jackson, Mississippi, all the way to this neighborhood, the small Indiana town of Richmond, and in one day at the Jeanette studio would make blues history. Charlie Patton arrived here at the beautiful train station in downtown Richmond, and he and a fellow bluesman named Walter Hawkins took the one mile trek from here to the Star Piano Factory along the Whitewater River. Now the Star Piano Company was owned by the Jeanette family. They produced pianos, phonographs, and had their own record division and their own label called Jeanette Records. And they had a recording studio in the back of the factory along the river, and right in front of it was a railroad spur that often caused the interruption of recording sessions in a very unique setting for blues recording. We are at the site of the Jeanette Recording Studio here in Richmond, right along the Whitewater River. And it is here that Charlie Patton arrived in 1929. But by then, this studio had already made music history with landmark recordings by the likes of Louis Armstrong, Bix Beiderbecke, Jelly Roll Morton, and Hoagy Carmichael. But with Charlie coming here from the Mississippi Delta, it was time to make blues history. We don't know for sure how old Charlie was when he arrived in Richmond. He doesn't have a birth certificate, but we assume he was in his late 30s. From the lone promotional photo taken of him, we know he was a small man of mixed race, possibly part Cherokee, with wavy hair and big ears. He'd never been in a recording studio before, but he played in juke joints and house parties for years in the Mississippi Delta. He was known as a wild showman and stories abounded about how he played the guitar between his legs and behind his head and how his gravelly voice could carry hundreds of yards. So when he came to Richmond, he had a whole bag of tricks. And in that sweltering heat on June 14th, he performed a lively mix of original blues, country music, and gospel tunes. I wrote this book on Jeanette Records called Jelly Roll Bix and Hoagie because I've always been fascinated how this record label could set a fire on the blues and jazz movement, often through pure serendipity. And that was the case with Charlie Patton. Definitely with Charlie Patton. <laughs> Charlie lived for years at the massive Dockery Plantation in the remote Mississippi Delta. By the 1920s, blues music was making commercial inroads with black consumers, and Charlie wanted a piece of the action. So he connected with H.C. Spear, a store owner three hours away in Jackson. C. Spear moonlighted as a blues talent scout in the evenings for the Northern record labels, and he drove all the three hours to the Dockery Plantation to listen to Charlie, and he loved what he heard. So Spear struck a deal with Paramount Records, owned by the Wisconsin Chair Company in Grafton, Wisconsin, just north of Chicago. Just as Jeanette Records pioneered jazz recording, Paramount pioneered black blues. But until now, Paramount had not substantially recorded any music from the distinct Mississippi Delta. But there was one problem. In 1929, Paramount Records stopped recording in Chicago in order to construct a new recording studio in its home base in Wisconsin. So they had nowhere to record Charlie Patton. Paramount struck a deal with Fred Jeanette to use the Jeanette studio in Richmond to record and master 78 disc. This recording ledger shows that Paramount paid Jeanette $40 for each track mastered of Charlie Patton. Paramount and Jeanette worked this arrangement with several blues artists in 1929, including Blind Blake and the very last recordings of the great Blind Lemon Jefferson. The business agreement was simple. The more recordings mastered by the Jeanette studio, the more money they made from the Paramount label. So when Charlie Patton arrived, the message was simple. Give us everything you got. And he sure delivered with some of his best recordings, gospel, blues, folk, some of his landmark records like Screamin' and Hollerin' Blues, Pony Blues, and of course the wonderful Spoonful Blues. Patton was also billed as Paramount's Mask Marvel. It was a bizarre promotion where record buyers had to guess who he was to win a free record. The records from Richmond sold modestly to black consumers in the South, 
But more importantly, Delta Blues music was being documented and disseminated. A movement had begun. With his recording career launched, over the next four years, Charlie recorded another 44 songs for Paramount at their studio in Wisconsin, and also for the Vocalion label in New York. But almost overnight, the commercial viability of these black blues records came to a crushing halt. The Great Depression crippled the recording industry, with the small labels being hit the hardest. Paramount stopped recording music in 1932, and Jeanette's Richmond studio produced its last music in 1934. That same year, Charlie Patton died in the Mississippi Delta and was buried in a field near the small town of Holly Ridge in an unmarked grave, a slight later rectified by rocker John Fogarty, who ensured that a beautiful marker was erected. Since his death, the music of Charlie Patton has been kept alive by thousands and thousands of musicians across the world, ranging from Bob Dylan to Jack White. But it's always exciting to come to Richmond, Indiana, because even though he spent just one day here in this town, almost a century ago, it is celebrated throughout this city. And why not? Because that one day changed blues music forever. No you the no you the Oh, you know you got on, mama, long as I got mine.